some of the ideas of what we can do in terms of sensory information and perception and ways that we can use technology today to actually enhance those things. So um, just a quick introduction again. My name is Tim Cannon. I'm the CTO of a company, a startup called Grindhouse Wetware. Um, we do open source DIY human augmentation, uh, low budget cybernetics research for hackers, biohackers they call us, or grinders. Um, and uh, we, we deal a lot with body modification people simply because uh, doctors won't talk to us. So, um, so what is a grinder? Well, uh, a grinder comes from a graphic novel, the term comes from a graphic novel called Dr. Sleepless, where it's set the future and people are frustrated by the fact that they didn't get their jetpack, you know, and they didn't get the future that Bugs Bunny cartoons promised them. And so they're frustrated, and so they take it upon themselves to start enhancing themselves, um, doing, doing things in basement labs and stuff like that. And that's what I do. I uh, do, do work in basement labs, hacker spaces, but it's all cybernetics type stuff, uh, implants and uh, devices to enhance sensory perception. So left anonym is one of our uh, somewhat notorious early grinders. Um, oftentimes they also call us practical transhumanists um, because we just believe in starting to transcend uh, some of the biological limitations of the human body uh, today in a practical and reasonable way. So uh, some of the things we've done, um, we built something called a thinking cap. We used something called transcranial direct current stimulation uh, to invoke flow states. Um, and that is actually defined. Flow is a mental state of operation in which a person performing an activity is fully immersed, feeling energized and focused, full involvement and enjoyment in the process or activity. In essence, flow is characterized by complete absorption in what one does. So this actually stimulates and increases uh, the excite, uh, it excites your neurons by putting a small amount of current across your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and uh, this causes that brain state flow. There are also other brain states that you can achieve with this. Um, you can actually uh, apply this to your motor cortex and it feels like your head is tilting from side to side. So right now we're actually trying to rig that into a flight simulator game control so that when you turn in the plane you actually feel yourself turning. Um, there's also cathodal stimulation. We use anodal stimulation, but cathodal stimulation can be used to actually reduce the excitability of neurons in certain parts of the brain, which can be actually good for learning uh, rather than the flow state, which is actually good at accessing things that you've already learned. One of the uh, things that we're working on now, uh, here are some prototype models uh, of a device called Circadia. Um, it is a uh, this is actually the modern version. Uh, I'm getting it implanted in my forearm in, set in a couple of months. Um, and basically it has eight LEDs that shine up through your skin, uh, showing the time in binary, because I am a giant, giant computer science nerd. So I love binary. Uh, it will also have a uh, temperature and a heartbeats per minute sensor, which uh, can give us real-time biological data. Um, it's kind of quantified self made simple. Um, it's got Bluetooth because everything is better with Bluetooth and also it makes it easy to get it onto the phone and then from there you can kick it up to just about any place in the internet of course. Um, so that's that's been coming along nicely and uh, we're getting it encapsulated and I think in a couple months. Um, Bottlenose is a device that I'll probably mostly be talking about for the purpose of this presentation. Um, that's some concept art of bottlenose. We have uh, an actual box device that I unfortunately forgot to bring. And basically what this is, is I have a rare earth neodymium magnet implanted in my left uh, ring finger. And what this does is it actually allows me to feel electrical fields because electrical fields cause an oscillation um, particularly AC, but I can also feel magnets, I can feel some DC currents. Now this kind of gives me more integration into the devices I use day to day. So, for example, I can feel my laptop hard drive working. I can feel how hard 
uh, my cell phone is pumping, I can feel various, um, various fields in the devices that I use. And so what we did, I got this implanted and I went and started hunting down fields and, and you know, seeing what I could see and it was very interesting. But I said, you know, it, 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 this seems like it could be more useful. It seems like I could take this and, and take any sensor, even something that's well outside of the human perception range, convert that data to a feeling that's intuitive, and then understand the thresholds of the, the sensor that I'm using. So in an example, we took a distance sensor, a uh, rangefinder, and we converted that to frequency of oscillation so that I would feel in my finger magnet this sort of vibration and it would get more and more frequent, so it would buzz faster as things approach the distance sensor and it would buzz slower as things left. So then it created this effect where if I closed my eyes, I could sweep it across the room and get a sense of echolocation, which is why we call it the bottlenose. Um, and this is a very interesting sensation because you can actually navigate a room with your eyes closed and kind of just get this map of what's going on in the room. Now, it's obviously extremely low resolution, but you can kind of detect where objects are and that sort of thing. Now, what's neat is that we're kind of borrowing from a, a, a brain structure that really already exists. You already have a sense of pressure, and it already can give you information on how much or how little. So it's already intuitive. It's already dealing with internal feelings um, that, that we understand in a much more natural way than, say, you know, high processing cognitive information. There's just a large difference between looking at the number of meters away that something is and feeling how far away it is. Um, so it's, it's a very different way of sensing the world. And you can do this with any sort of sensor so you can know how co 2 it feels in a room or how radioactive it feels in a room. And, uh, and obviously there are some uses there. Um, so my, my hypothesis is that we can borrow our, uh, our senses to make new maps and process new information um, and kind of create new behaviors that we don't necessarily expect. Um, so sensory experience, so for example, sound. <coughs> sound is, is just simply two vectors. Um, sound, if you uh, have frequency and you have amplitude, and from that you can create tone and volume. Uh, I can also experience uh, frequency and amplitude through my finger magnet. Um, so I can tell the difference between a microwave running and my laptop charger. I can tell the difference between a strong signal and a weak one, and I can even feel news of difference and change in the tones in real time. So I can actually kind of feel these things going up and down, and I can, I can get that news of difference, and it immediately maps into other pieces of my, uh, you know, other senses that I have, and that becomes part of my perceptual set. So, um, you know, we have a lot of sensory adaptation. Um, from my understanding, the uh, audio cortex, for example, is not really well, well developed uh, for babies. They pretty much get highs and lows, and then everything else is learned by uh, the, the neurons actually creating maps, which is why people who major in music are capable of hearing differences in notes a lot better because they've trained that particular part of their brain to actually uh, function at a higher level and pick out those differences uh, better. So you have um, bottom-up sensory in, in, into your perceptual set. You have a bottom-up kind of method where your senses make you aware of something, and then it becomes part of something that you can cognitively react to. So if you smell something bad, you know, you, you can start to kind of suss out what that means. But before you really recognize what it is or what the ramifications of it are, you just really kind of immediately recognize, this is bad. I should probably figure this out. And so you have a bottom-up adaptation where senses bubble things up, and then we can start to learn to find them, and we can start to learn to pick them out of sensory signals. Now you also have a top-down, which is kind of like the music major, where you have something that's part of your, your, your set, your perceptual set, or you're, you're made aware of something on an intellectual level, I should say, 
And then you start to request that your senses hold for this particular data. And when you have a top-down kind of experience, sometimes, I mean, there are limits. There's limits to the human body. But if you have devices that don't have any such limitations, the question is, what couldn't you perceive? And, and how would that affect your day-to-day -day life and your day-to-day -day behavior? Um, if you have accurate data information as well on things that you normally couldn't get, you'd have to get them from your cognitive uh, set. So everybody in here knows what instinct is, so I'm not going to repeat the definition. But uh, just something to be made aware of, you know, 90% of the time you're not really aware of your sense of smell, uh, for example. And you have instinctual behaviors and you have instinctual um, kind of feelings, and these feelings are, in my opinion, far more uh, impressive to the human being than facts are. Facts tend to be something that we choose, whereas feelings are something that we, we don't necessarily choose. And you know, an example of this is if you come to be intellectually convinced of something, you may actually feel kind of you know, bizarre about expressing that opinion if, it, if it's contrary to, to what you believed before. So for example, I've recently changed my opinion on gun control. And uh, so for years I was raised in a house that was uh, really Second Amendment down your throat, so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and I like guns, I think they're fun, I was in the army, uh, that sort of thing. So, but I watched a couple of things, The Daily Show had an amazing piece on, on gun control in Australia, I've come to change my opinion, but it's odd, I feel dirty. When I say that, I believe in gun control because I spent so much time uh, uh, believing in that. And so even though the facts are there, I don't feel good about those facts. And so for some reason, it's causing this conflict. Feeling good about the facts you think, I would say, are more important than the actual facts. Because if you don't feel good about them, a lot of times you want to express them. You might have solid evidence that something that you believe is wrong, but you'll choose to ignore those facts whereas you won't choose to ignore your feelings. You can't choose to ignore your feelings. Um, so what I'm suggesting and what I'd like to see um, as far as kind of, and I think I'm going really quick here, so I hope you guys have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, um, what I would like to see is the use of data mashups and then pump them into the natural senses that people have so that they can correct their behaviors in an appropriate way. So, for example, um, you may feel like you're in danger in some part of town because you have, say, natural prejudices. However, if you have something pumping in you that actually gives you the crime rates of the area that you're in, you actually have a natural feeling as to whether that is prejudice or whether you're actually in a high crime area. And so that sort of disparity can then call to the attention of the person, I'm not, this is, this is not me, I have something wrong with the way I'm perceiving the world. There's something wrong here. And the problem is we have this neofrontal cortex, which is an amazing, amazing machine for predicting things poorly. We, you know, so um, we, we tend to think that we, ha and, and, and worse, worse than that is that you have this conscious experience that's perpetually convincing you that whatever your neofrontal cortex delivers, it's got to be right. There was um, an experiment done where people uh, were taken in a couple of days after the Challenger shuttle blew up, which you guys might not know about or remember, but um, you know that when the Challenger shuttle blew up, they took people in and they said, what were you doing that day? And then they brought them back in two years later and they said, what were you doing that day? Now, they were studying an, a known phenomenon where memory degrades. But what was surprising about the study was when they asked them, why is there a disparity in your two stories? They said, I don't know why I would have lied back then. Now, that doesn't make any sense. They thought that they, the original story they told was the dishonest version because they were so sure that the present moment was correct that they couldn't acknowledge this fact. And there was a, a cognitive dissonance that, that took hold. And so um, what I seek to do with some of this stuff that I'm trying to do is, is to uh, attempt to kind of make that more in your face and more perpetual so that you're constantly at odds with your cognitive dissonance and you can start to 
you know, rely on data and rely on facts. Because in the world that we live in, feelings just aren't nearly as useful as they were on the African savanna. You know, they're just not, they're not as useful. Um, because we can't predict things well. Um, so one of the suggested ways, of course, I just went over was behavior uh, correction. And so my, my generic idea is to say, have 10 magnets in my finger, right? And a glove that basically gives me 10 different data vectors. And so over time of use of this, I'll have a general feeling of what tune I'm in. So I'll have weather and crime rates and smog rates and and you know where the nearest Wi-Fi station is, and uh, you know whether or not I'm in a country that's going to arrest me for speaking freely or you know, being the asshole I am. Um, you know what? You know what is? And then that it becomes a natural feeling, something that is unquestionable. So when you're you start to feel like you're in danger, or it starts to feel like the weather's coming in, uh, or something like that, you know how to react appropriately and you're going with real data, not just these kind of hazy feelings which could easily be influenced by prejudice or you know, uh, some sort of other misperception, um, you know, data you know, corruption from just the brain being what it is. Um, so another idea that I've had with this 10, 10 magnet uh, interface was the idea of kind of, and it doesn't have to be magnets, you can do this easily with a, a vibrating motor that goes in intensity or whatever, you won't get the kind of resolution that I get, but you know, when it's in your body, you actually can, I can feel fields like really, really far out and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, for compatibility, I, I basically had the idea where, you know, for example, if you did some sort of like speed dating thing, I think that that would trim a whole lot out of the need to get to know you, to get to know me, because if you guys sit down together and you can feel where you're in tune, and you know what your last girlfriend was like, and you know what the girlfriend before her was like, and, and every time they're like that, you, you, know, you definitely want to go the other direction, run far and fast. Um, so, um, empathy is another one. Um, being able to come into contact with somebody and immediately know various factors like stress, um, mood level, um, you know, those sorts of things, even getting biological data so that you have a generic understanding of how that person is feeling. And, and there are ways in which you could then, I think it would at least direct you to attempt to empathize with somebody a little more. If, because a lot of people put on the stoic mask, a lot of people put on the face and say, I'm happy, when really all they want is for somebody to just say, no, how are you doing? Like, really, how are you doing? You know, and a lot of times you can't, you can't make that determination. And it's almost offensive to some people to make that determination. But when you have real data, real data that they can't deny, and you look at them and say, look, Steve, I know you're hurting. I know it. I can feel it. At that point, I think that you can be directed to empathize more with people. So um, basically, these technologies that, that are coming out of hacker spaces and coming out of basement labs and things like this are actually at the forefront of these sorts of things simply because there are a lot of restrictions that go into academic research, there's a lot of restrictions that go into corporate research, there's a lot of issues like that that people have in, in pushing this stuff forward. Like I said, doctors won't talk to us, um, that sort of thing. But when it's us in the basement with stuff that we can use, you know, me and my buddy say, you know, we should convene an ethics panel. You think it's ethical? Yeah, me too, let's go. You know, um, so, um, yeah. Anyway, um, so other people that are experimenting, obviously Grindhouse Wetware is experimenting. Um, there's a fellow named Neil Harbison who's a pretty interesting guy. I don't know if anybody's heard of this guy. He invented a device called iBorg, and it's a head-mounted camera. He is um, severely colorblind. I think it's called somnochromatic, and uh, he's severely colorblind. <laughs> and so he has this head-mounted camera, and whatever it's pointing at, it converts that color into a particular tone. Things on the higher color range, like on, on the blue spectrum, are higher frequencies, lower frequencies for, for deeper colors. And um, he's actually able to perceive colors that humans can't. He's actually able to perceive colors higher than what the human eye can perceive through his audio cortex because the range 
is better and it's more geared towards putting the right data in the right place. Uh, Biohack.me is a group of really cool biohackers, tinkerers. It's uh, one of the places to go to get involved in a lot of discussions when it comes to biohacking and uh, you know DIY, practical transhumanism, these sorts of things. Uh, here in DC, on Thursday nights, they do a grinder night. It's uh, on, at the Hack DC, the DC hackerspace. Uh, does Thursday nights does Grind DC, and it's all about biohacking and building cybernetics and that sort of stuff. There's also a professor uh, out in England uh, named Kevin Warwick. He's done a couple of TED Talks, and um, he's a really interesting fellow. He's done a lot of like really avant-garde research and, and things like that and really taken it far. He, he made a joke about how uh, he was getting a finger magnet implant for one of his students, and uh, he, he just thought it was completely silly because you got a, a campus full of <coughs> would-be surgeons and, and people who are brilliant, and he had to go to some piercer, and on the ethics forms, he had to write, Dr. Evil was the guy doing the procedure, because the guy, the piercer, he went by the name Dr. Evil. And so, it's kind of ridiculous, the restrictions that go into that. Um, and that's why people like me um, are actually kind of out, starting to outpace business and academia, is simply because we're taking a different road. Um, and we don't have to ask permission. And besides, I'd, I'd rather beg forgiveness than ask permission. Um, okay, well, that went way too fast, I think. And um, so I guess we'll just open things up to questions and, you know, talk. And then if not, you know, you guys don't have to listen to me anymore. So, up? Uh, I'm curious as to how a magnet in your finger can translate um, into a distance sensor. So, in, no, what we do is we actually create, uh, we create a device that it fits into a glove like that concept art, and basically it has a distance sensor on it that we pump through a microcontroller with a little bit of code and then just convert it into an electromagnet that sits right over the magnet interface uh, for the finger, right? So, um, yeah, so that, that ends up being how we translate. And then, obviously, extending that idea, from there, you can put any sensor in place, and as long as you know how to translate the data, you're good. Uh, you had your hand. Um, it's actually the magnet is so small that it, it very rarely affects anything. However, uh, one caveat: um, I, I have a buddy in New York who has the biggest finger magnet implants in the world right now, and um, he has a Mac. And the Mac has a magnet thing that tells it when to go to sleep. And so he'll just be sitting there working all of a sudden, Charge! you know, and he shut his computer down. And, you know, but, you know, so you know, there are some, some some things you have to get used to. Yeah. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, like, you said something about um, like having all these things in your fingers and one like, the weather and all that. Mm -hmm. How would you? Well, basically, that's what we would do with the device. So it would be like a small device, basically, like almost like a glove or something that's really thin that you could like fit over your fingers and, and that sort of thing. And we have some concepts for making it as lightweight as possible, which you can make this pretty, pretty lightweight. Um, and so, yeah, then you just have a range of sensors. I mean, you could even borrow sensory data from your cell phone. So it could be a, like maybe a GPS of how far you are away from your house and maybe what direction it is or something like that. You know, just all sorts of things that you can take. So anything that you could sense electromechanically or otherwise, you could then pump into this and get a natural understanding for what that is. Yeah. Can you explain the part again about uh, being able to feel more empathetic? Yeah, so um, basically, I guess you would, well, you would feel a display, you would feel that person and like say you had, again, you have these 10 vectors of data, so some sort of biological data um, mashup that kind of says, you know, on this finger I'm kind of getting mood data, on this finger I'm getting kind of health data, on this finger I'm getting whatever. And so as, so if you approach, say, your dad and he looks preoccupied and all of a sudden your finger just like dips down really low, like, pops, what's wrong? You know, I mean, like, you okay? So, I mean, so you can, it can actually direct you to be more empathic simply because they're going, they can't help but give you that data. There's no amount of masking or acting 
that will, will be able to hide that, unless, of course, they choose to hide. Right. Um, you. Um, so I, I understand the, the benefits of the of empathizing with, with the others, but wouldn't some people view that as an invasion of privacy? Because, as you said, they put on this stoic face and they don't want people to know, like, you know, oh, I, I just broke up with my girlfriend or stuff, something like that. So, Well, um, I think some people would probably want to hide it, just like some people want to hide now. However, I also think that there are some people who don't want to hide, but do. And I think that those people would, would be the people who, who would benefit from that. I mean, but then again, at the same time, just just on a on a side note, you know, privacy is going the way of the buffalo, so everybody can get used to that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. All right. So uh, the way so you, the things you're picking up from from the empathy mm -hmm. uh, thing, are you picking up like like biological chemicals that are released? No, I mean they would have it would have to be like kind of a mutually agreed upon. So, you know, uh, they're wearing one, you're wearing one, and then maybe your left hand corresponds to that person, and your, your data corresponds to you, so that you have like a disparity between you and them or something like that. And then they would have the same system transmitting usually. So how does, how does the signal from the brain that's the carrying the motion go down and back down? Well, now that would be the, that would be the more complicated part. Now, I I, I was actually uh, I was telling him earlier before the talk. Um, we built that device that device thinking app that does the um, uh, cranial simulation. Well, that uh, in and of itself, we were trying to add a low resolution EEG as well, so that you basically have in your in your actual headwear you have something that's kind of reading your uh, brain uh, signals and kind of maybe interpreting that data as needed. Um, okay, she had a question, and then you had a question, and then you had a question. So, do you want to go first? Let me just follow up on that. So, there's code right now on GitHub, which takes um, webcam data, and it's so high resolution, current webcams, that it then sees, um, it can interpret the um, pulse rate from that, fo from that photo. So, you basically, you're, you're looking into a webcam, talking to a webcam, the webcam decodes that information, finds your face, and then finds where the blood vessels are underneath the surface of your face